This week on the Red Sneaker Writers Podcast. I think just stop worrying about it so much. Um, Honestly, especially in the first draft, I think people have a tendency to uh, let their inner critic dominate the entire process. And the truth is, is that most first drafts are going to be bad or, you know, not what you expect it to be at the very least. Welcome to the Red Sneaker Writers Podcast. News, interviews, and writing tips for people who are serious about having a writing career and want some practical knowledge to help them achieve it. Your host is the nationally best-selling author of more than 50 books, William Bernhardt. Hello, sneakers, and happy new year. This is the first Red Sneaker Writers Podcast for 2022. I hope at least one of your new year resolutions was about doubling down on your writing and making this year the year that it happens, which may mean committing to a regular writing schedule or getting mentoring or feedback or attending a conference to find an agent or to get the knowledge you need to succeed in the writing and publishing business. Whatever your writing resolution may be, hey, we are here to help. So on this podcast, I'll be offering my suggestions and prognostications (laughs) to help all you Red Sneaker writers chart your course for 2022. And as always, I'm joined by my faithful sound engineer and cohort, Jesse Ulrich. Jesse, do you make any New New Year's resolutions for 2022? No, I've tried to not make New Year's resolutions. Only because... There's so much pressure put on a New Year's resolution, and I'm just like already like my New Year's resolution was to continue to grow and grow my podcast production business, but sure. also somehow also work less. So mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, we'll see how that goes. I guess that's my one resolution. But I've been thinking about that for the past six months. So okay, your Wheel of Time podcast must have ended, right? Because the show yes, ended. Yes, we. So that's we a little less the, work. That's true. That was a lot of work. It was a lot of dragging video equipment to a bar, which not the best place to set up anyway. <laughs> So, but it was fun. And um, now, now we just wait uh, until, until season next two. Season. Until season two. We'll, we'll have this... some episodes, fill in some time, you know. Good. Whereas uh, this podcast just goes on and on every other week, right? Every so other week. No seasons, no breaks. This well, is our 91st episode, believe it or not. So really, we should be planning something super for the 100th. I don't ooh, we should. have Listen, any ideas. I want to do more episodes of this podcast than James Patterson has books. Can we do that? That would take a while, but okay, sure. Like... Uh, except he does like six a month, so no, I don't think we could ever catch up. <laughs> oh, we can never catch up, man. All right. <laughs> Sneakers, my guest today is Tanya Goff, who is the brilliant creator of a new tool for writers called Story Builder, which actually does not officially debut until next month. But we have her now so that you can get the heads up and maybe the first shot at beta testing or taking a look at Story Builder, something that also might help you achieve your writing goals for 2022. And we'll be talking about that later. But first, the news. All right, I called this the news because, you know, I always say that this is the news, but it's really not. I mean, it's sort of news in the global sense, but what I'm really going to look at are the trends that we saw emerging and becoming dominant in 2021, and then maybe shift to prognosticating about what's going to happen in the year to come, which is always a dangerous business. But I do think there are some pretty clear trends, which I've kind of bunched together into four different categories. Number one, and this is very much based upon what happened in 2021. We've been talking for probably since before the podcast began about how important social media has become for book marketing. But in 2021, we definitely saw a a decisive shift in the social media landscape. I mean, not that anything has disappeared, but clearly some things are becoming less important less effective, whereas you knew I was going to say this, TikTok and book talk are becoming dominant in marketing. Everybody wants to be 
on TikTok. And believe me, I'm working right now to find somebody who could talk about that for the podcast. If you can get an influencer with a big following on Book Talk to promote your book, that is golden. There are entitled disp- entire display tables at Barnes & Noble now just stocking book talk book talk you know uh, what people are recommending on book talk and they sell very well i saw one of my daughters at christmas time get a colleen hoover that's a coho box of goodies that's you know renewed fame for books that aren't even new that came completely due to book talk i I got another daughter the other day i was hearing say you know she's on book talk and she doesn't even read honestly but she but she's still watching book talk videos these things have become hugely influential influential amazon marketing of course is still there but people are finding it a little bit less effective because everybody's doing it book bubs are great but they're hard to get and because it's diluted somewhat because they're doing like four different programs a day that, you know, still don't kid yourself, still a great thing to have, but maybe not as fabulous as it once was. Facebook ads have been impacted by Apple's decision, you know, the new rules dis- uh, disrupting email marketing and you have to give people permission to follow you and whatnot. So social media is changing TikTok is becoming huge. Jesse, you're a big TikTok guy, I'm guessing, right? <laughs> I listen, I've been try- I'm trying to figure out TikTok because apparently <laughs> it is what we all need to do. But yeah. I guess there is a difference between like making a Facebook post to me than making a TikTok video. That's a, there's a level of intensity and time that I need to learn how to spend correctly on TikTok. And I'm just, you know, especially during the pandemic, I'm like, I have to get dressed to do a social right. media post That's now. True. Like, it's a lot of work. I suppose if you could just sit down and, you know, I mean, they're short, right? But yeah, you've got to, you want to shave probably first. <laughs> and and uh, although, am I dressed up for this? No, but anyway. Okay. Item number two a significant increase in independent authors. And by that, I mean either small press or most of the often self-published authors making it into the world of TV film, which is often what people consider the Holy Grail, even if you're a complete book nerd like I am. But there's no question about the fact that a Game of Thrones type series will propel book sales. Hugh Howey, who was actually one of the first big names to come out of the self-publishing world with his science fiction series wool that's making its way to apple tv which also just did that fabulous series on isaac asimov's foundation the supernatural academy series is coming to peacock and that's just an increase in years to come because some have been very successful but watch out red sneaker writers there are some scammers out there Reputable film companies, producers, licensors do not ask you for money. This is the equivalent of the vanity press. They're not supposed to be asking you for money. It's supposed to go the other way around. So if they're asking you for cash, don't do it. Trend number three. We've been debating, again, since probably the podcast began about should you be Amazon exclusive? Should you go wide, meaning go to all the online and for that matter, brick and mortar booksellers. And really, there's been no clear answer to this question, except in 2021, it may, became very clear that most of the most successful small press, indie, or hybrid authors were going wide. They call it wide for the win, or wide is the new black, I've heard, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first one works. Why would you come up with the second one? And it's so much more alliterative, yeah. too. Uh, but the point, uh, uh, that's not putting down Apple at all. Apple, I mean, you've got to be at Apple. They sell more, uh, not Apple, at Amazon. They sell more books than anybody else. And Amazon ads are still very effective. But most people are, uh, you know, putting KU and Amazon exclusive deals on the back burner and going wide direct sales some people selling directly from their website even are continuing to grow and of course a lot of indie authors are embracing tech which leads me to point number four there is clearly going to be a greater reliance on tech like there hasn't been before but even more so whether you're talking about ai audiobook narration which is becoming very credible or nfts 
which I expect to be big. You know, all it's going to take is one big name, James Patterson, Stephen King guy to make a million bucks selling an NFT. And then everybody's going to be doing it, right? Here's the or, thing, though. Like, a, yeah? a James Patterson fan has to understand what an NFT is. Right. right. So, are you are you suggesting that they're of an age or what are you I, saying? I'm just saying the James Patterson readers I know mm-hmm. have difficulty understanding both what like an NFT is and what cryptocurrency is. So that's what, you know my son Ralph is a fantastic photographer and he was showing me the other day this uh OpenSea is that what it's called this platform online where people are sell you know you can sell any kind of images but he of course was looking at photography and nature photography and I might be biased, but I don't think anything he showed me was nearly as well as his, as good as his work. And people were selling these NFTs of their photographs for astronomical amounts. Yeah. I mean, six digit number amounts of money. Can you explain that? It's really like, this is all about what people are willing to pay for it. Like we, mm-hmm. we can't make sense of it. Cause again, like if you have too long of a conversation about any of this, you realize nothing's real. Um, even, <laughs> even like the money we think is real. It's not real. So no, wrong books are real. Books. That's, that's why we're here. Books are real. True. That's the one thing that is real actual yeah. physical books. So books are real and will really help you, but I, I make your life better, but, uh, algorithms and other tech might help people find your books. This is one of the, arguably, at least for authors, good things that actually came out of the pandemic. I'm not not suggesting it's over, but when you're compiling that short list of pandemic pluses, it has clearly advanced the adoption of digital tech. Some people are saying by as much as 10 years, leading to many, many more people reading eBooks, downloading them, shopping online and whatnot. And just as new technology is now powering more direct ebook sales, it's also clearly going to change the way authors write and the way they deal with and sell their intellectual properties. So red sneaker writers, don't be afraid of technology. If you don't get it, find help. It's out there. You can find somebody, you can go to conferences, you can subscribe to my Red Sneaker Writers newsletter, which is completely free. Come to WriterCon or other conferences, but don't think you can survive without it because that's going to be increasingly hard in the days to come. Okay, Jesse, what's your pick? What's going to be the big way that tech impacts the book world in the years to come, in, in in the next year, let's say? Well, um, you know, CES just ended, you know, the Consumer Electronics Showcase in Las Vegas, which apparently no one right. went to physically, but a lot of people watched it virtually. And there were a lot of augmented glasses being sold, or really? even like v- very smaller than normal VR glasses. I'm still waiting for the like sort of immersive reading experience mm-hmm. where like the author could curate what music is playing while people are reading certain chapters or, you know, um, a combination of both like reading and hearing the story. Um, and sort of that, you know, whether it's through glasses or headphones or those invisible headphones, which I don't know if you saw, invisible headphones where they just shoot audio right by your ears. I don't know how it works. Um, there's one of these things is going to help um, authors in some way. We still know mm-hmm. how it's going to connect yet. But I'm now that we have those sort of immersive screens where it's like right. a 55 inch OLED and you're in a couch five, like three feet from it. Like when is the book version of that going to happen? Mm hmm. So I suspect, I don't know what the format's going to be, but it's, it's clearly going to happen. And what do you, you know, and this is a segue to our guests, so I won't say much, but artificial intelligence tools for writing are clearly gaining in popularity and more and more authors are using machines to increase their productivity one way or another. I think we've got, I mean, since 2009, we've had a divide between so-called traditional publishing and indie publishing. That's going to continue to grow. Uh, And in some cases, one doesn't know what the other is doing. In some cases, one traditional publishing is clearly imitating what the other is doing. But, you know, at some point, they almost are starting to look like completely different businesses. They may most may both ge- gravitate around books, but they are so different. And, uh, you know, indie small presses, independents have adopted a more inclusive, collaborative, and forward thinking mindset, which is why 
they seem to be doing well in this tech environment where others are floundering and why authors in that world seem to be doing better financially. All right, Jesse, I think it's time to bring on our very special guest. Can you bring out Tanya Goff? Tanya, are you out there? Hi, I'm here. There she is. Hey, thanks yeah. so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what my first question is going to be, mm-hmm. although I know you clearly could offer much advice. If you had to pare it down to one piece of advice to offer to writers at any stage in their careers, what would it be? I think just stop worrying about it so much. Um, <laughs> honestly, I, it, especially in the first draft, I think people have a tendency to uh, let their inner critic dominate the entire process. And right. the truth is, is that most first drafts are going to be bad or, you know, not what you expect it to be at the very least. And, and seem <laughs> so, worse when yeah. you're writing them. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, get get the first draft done and then bring out your inner critic and use that as a way of refining and honing and getting it right. Um, I, I think things have gotten a little bit muddled uh, lately in particular, just because there are a lot of people who are now writing and publishing in real time, which makes mm-hmm. it a lot more difficult to, you know, separate those two things. But, you know, so there's no editing process. There's no drafting and, and rewriting uh, or not as much, um, at least in, th- in, in like fan fiction websites and people who uh, are publishing on like public, you know, in, in public venues. Um, but I think that things have gotten sort of muddled in that, you know, if you're writing a proper novel and you're expecting to publish it or at least produce it, you know, as a whole, then just get the first draft done mm-hmm. and have fun with it. I mean, that's where you should be enjoying the process. And if you're not enjoying the process in the first draft, then you're probably not going to finish, you know, so right. you know, just go with it. I completely yeah. agree with that. Although mm-hmm. I'm horrified by, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I've written 57 mm-hmm. books. I still think my first drafts are terrible. Yeah. They usually mm-hmm. are not, not quite as bad as I remember them being when I read it the second time, but that doesn't mean I want anybody to read them. (laughs) The first draft are people really publishing first drafts and. Oh goodness. In, in, uh, in droves. I mean, uh, uh, Wattpad, which is a Canadian uh, success story. Uh, they're, they're, they've got what 90 million unique visitors a month right now. Um, last I checked about 4 million of them were, were writing at any given time. Um, and the process is really, I mean, they give you a text box to do your writing and you do one chapter at a time and you publish out and then people comment and, and, uh, reflect on what you're doing, which could actually results in some really interesting things because sometimes people will change their narrative or they'll go back and rewrite stories, uh, as though they were dream sequences. And there's a whole bunch of sort of interactive, um, uh, you know, writing uh, process that sort of come out of, you know, come out of it. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, Charles Dickens, but on crack, I guess. It's uh, it's really quite interesting. What a horrifying yeah. thought. People yeah. reading mm-hmm. as you're writing it. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, well, chapter by chapter. So they're not watching the words go on the page. So you have you have one chapter to to write and presumably proofread before you publish it out. But a lot of people are just publishing the stuff straight out and it's just straight from brain to page. I mean, how do you deal with that? If you write a chapter and somebody starts posting, oh, I don't really like that carrot, are you going to scrap it? Or, well, <laughs> I mean, yeah. you um, presumably have a larger plan for this book. Um, you would think so. Um, but the the community, especially for the fan fiction community, uh, is incredibly inclusive and incredibly um, uh, supportive. Um, mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a rather interesting phenomenon and it's growing like crazy. I mean, they're are multiple sort of Wattpad uh, imitators that are hitting the market now like crazy. So, But fan fiction, mm-hmm. by definition, yeah. can't be mm-hmm. sold, right? At least can't not without sold. changing all the names and doing that, a... That's right. But, I mean, you have you have uh, situations like uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, which is actually mm-hmm. Twilight fan fiction. Right. And she just went in and changed all the names for it, and boom, she had a publishing contract. So Right, or yeah, After by like Anna happened. Todd started yeah. out as uh, mm-hmm. Harry yeah. Styles yeah. <laughs> fantasy fiction, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. Wow. Well, let's talk about <laughs> your brainchild, Story yeah. Builder. Uh, yes. Where did that come from? Where did the idea gravitate from? Um, so I think Story Builder is really the center of a Venn diagram of my very messy life. <laughs> um, I've, I've been at various points. Uh, well, my, my degrees are in English literature. So English is, and, and literature is really uh, something that I've studied in school. I've been a teacher. I taught in Japan for four years. Um, I later um, came back and opened a CD and video store in Stratford, Ontario, which ran for a while when those still were a thing. Mm. Um, but we're still sort of, and we had, been, you know, we had a, a Shakespeare specialty catalog that 
sort of evolved out of that, which sort of tied into sort of the educational things that I had done in the past. And um, and then after that, ended up working a career, turning into a career of uh, just various parts of content. So I, at this point in my career now, I've done everything from web development to information architecture, to content creation, digital marketing. So like everything on the content spectrum, I kind of like live there. Right. So when the idea came to me, which sort of came out of coffee, it was one of those coffee shop sort of ideas. Um, I, I understood that what I wanted to do was to create a writing program that um, that helped people who were in the early stages of their writing process. There are a ton of tools out there right now. I mean, you can use things like Scrivener, which are you know fantastic, but they're really, really feature loaded. And if you're mm-hmm. new to writing and you don't really know what you're doing yet, it's it's a lot of stuff. So really what I wanted to do was create an environment where newer writers could come and explore and write the stories that they wanted to write, but with mm-hmm. an underlying education layer that was built into it so that you have the support that you need to figure out how to do your writing and learn how to do the writing as you're going along without somebody actually like sitting over your shoulder and actually telling you what to do. Right. Now, am I right in thinking you you did the work on this yourself? You built this all by your lonesome, right? I did. Yeah. Um, I built the entire platform, all the content. Um, yeah, it's all me. That's very impressive. Okay. Describe. Well, so what is it web-based? Is it an app or program that you download to your computer? How does it work? Uh, yeah. So I built it uh, originally as a web-based platform. So you go on the web on your desktop, basically, for the, for the moment. We'll spit out other versions later on. Uh, but for me, there were a lot of um, inter- in- interconnecting pieces that I felt needed to be uh, figured out and developed. And that was easier done on desktop to begin with. And when, when I have people going into the system and you know we've got some, some regular use, then I'll be able to do things like an app. But for an app, I really want to make sure that the app is something that can work offline and then connect to the mothership later on if and when you have um, uh, internet connection so that you're not dependent on it. So that cool. was uh, that was the plan. Yeah, I can see we've got some people watching this live. So let me just uh, send a shout out. If you've got a question you'd like to pose to Tanya, put it in the chat box, which I'm opening right now, so I can see them come in, and I'll pass that question along. So okay, so I go to the website Story Builder. What is it? Storybuilder.com. It's Storybuilder.com. Uh, Story Builder is spelled B-I-L-D-E-R. There's no you. Right. All we're missing is you. Um, so, um, and I'll put that in the show notes too, people, but go ahead, please. Thanks. Uh, yeah. And then that was, that was an intentional, um, uh, misspell. It's not really a misspelling. Right. And so far as, uh, the so word B-I-L-D trademark. means, um, well, B-I-L-D means to picture or to imagine in about 14 different languages. So uh, we wanted to make sure that that was sort of part of our, uh, identity. Oh, very cool. Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. So mm-hmm. I go to the website, mm-hmm. I'm a writer, I'm looking mm-hmm. for something to help with something what happens when I go uh, to the well, website? You, you'll sign up um, as of next month <laughs> when we have uh, everything set up. Uh, we're almost there. Um, and uh, you'll log in. Uh, we'll put you through a, um, a, a, a wizard of sorts that will help you to sort of make some decisions, early decisions, about what kind of story that you're writing. Uh, we'll give you some archetypes to start off, with, you know, your basic seven story, your, your, your seven basic plots or some, some blank uh, structures. If you just want to do uh, your own uh, three act, your own five act, whatever, however you want to structure your story, you can do it your own way, or you can use the, um, uh, the structures that we provide. Uh, you mm-hmm. pick your genres. We've also got education that's um, specific to different, different genres. Um, I have to say that at the moment, we're very science fiction and fantasy heavy <laughs> in that respect. Uh, that's mm-hmm. where I live. Um, and I'm also on the board of directors of Canada's Sunburst Award, which is um, a, a literary award for science fiction, fantasy, speculative fiction up here. Um, so I have, a, I have a tendency to overfill in that space and backfill everything else. Um, and, uh, and then when you go into the platform, uh, then you have some options. You can either go through the story engine uh, which is, gives you a limited view. There are fewer options. And if you're new to writing, you may, may, may not want to have as many um, questions or things to work with. You'll create some, we have some forms to help you create your world, some forms to help you create your characters. And then you'll go into the writing process, which uh, has a, a series of prompts that will help you understand sort of what's expected of your story as you're going along. And that's at a very sort of broad uh, sort mm-hmm. of narrative structure level. Uh, we'll never tell you what to do. Everything's always suggestive, and never, and uh, never, we will never tell you what you must do. 
Um, and uh, you're always welcome to take our suggestions or ignore them or mm -hmm. do what we say or break them. And everything that we have in the system is breakable and editable, and you can make it your own. Uh, if you go into the toolbox, there's more options there. And then there's a library full of, uh, of uh, characters, maps, and outlines from classic literature that you can borrow into your story and uh, do whatever you want with. So. Now, I hear you saying we. Are these ideas, uh, are these suggestions coming from an artificial intelligence or from somebody reading it on the other end or what? Uh, no, it's all hard baked into the system at the mm -hmm. moment. Um, the uh, the uh, there will be an AI element to this, in that we will, as time goes on and we have more users on the site, we'll be able to be more predictive um, and recognize where people are starting to go astray. But again, um, we never really want to tell you that what you're doing is wrong. We just want to educate you as to what's normally expected in a particular situation, so that if, if for example, you're working in a, a plot arc. Uh, that normally looks like a triangle, and your story is doing this, uh, then, you know, <laughs> if that's a choice, then that's a choice. And that's, uh -huh. you know, more power to you. If you could figure out how to play with it and make that work, then that's up to you. Uh, but if you're not, if you're doing it because you don't know any better and you haven't really been given any guidance, then we can provide you with that. So, so is guess. it going to actually make, mm -hmm. like, suggest, like, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. This, char this character seems a little fl flat. Here's something you might do to make it better. That sort of suggestion? Um, it, it probably won't be that granular for some time. Um, I don't think that AI in general is really capable of providing that level of uh, specificity yet. Um, but what we can do is, I, I, my, my focus largely on um, a narrative, uh, narrative structure, mm -hmm. uh, which I think helps people with the framework. And then that gives you more time to sort of play and, and develop you know, the actual story within it. Mm -hmm. um, and by doing that, then it helps us to help you help writers keep their story on track. Um, and then, you know, if, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be, we'll be adding things like, like tone sensors and things like that. So if you think that you're writing a, a scene that is very like high paced, but the language and the tone, the actual tone pacing of it is very slow, uh, we could flag that for you. So I'm guessing that some people listening to this are going to wonder, how techy do I really need to be uh, to use this? Like Jesse and I were talking about before, there's a, a, a lot of tech tools out there for writers, but you know, some people would rather just write and not try and uh, figure out computer programs and whatnot. How tech proficient do you need to be to use this? Uh, well, my mother can work her way through it, um, so that's always a good sign. Um, <laughs> and my, my, if I ever yes. if I ever want to test anything that is uh, tech based, I give it to my mom, and if she can break it, she will break it in ten minutes flat. It's she's it's like her superpower. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I'm really designing Story Builder to be accessible to you know most most writers and most people who just really want to write. You should be able to follow along and follow the basic steps and be able to put your story together without um, having to understand you know, the technology behind it. I've spent quite a lot of time um, building the technology so that everything would be as integrated as possible so that whatever it is that you want to do, it should be available to you in the place that you are in the, you know, uh, on the site. Mm -hmm. So if you, you're looking at some like the tagging system, you're trying to uh, put some notes down and you remember you want to write something, you should be able to add that text in on the fly. Uh, you can do that. Sure. Yeah. I see a question that's yeah. come in from someone. They're asking, is the text saved as a PDF or WPD, word processing document? Uh, so the text is all saved within our system and you'll be able to um, export it in uh, a PDF or, or word pro format. Whatever you want. Uh, we've, got, we've got XML for game developers because we've got some people who like the uh, world building oh. aspect to it. So. Oh, that's cool. That's yeah. nice. Yeah. So you've mentioned this is, is launching, in, or one of us mentioned that it's launching in February, <laughs> yeah. but is there a reason to go now? Can they get in early on this program or what? Um, yeah, they can. Um, well, first, uh, first step is uh, to go to the website and sign up for our newsletter. We are going to be launching next, uh, well, next week we will be announcing um, our official launch, and that will be including a short story writing con competition. Uh, there are going to be two prizes. There's an internally judged prize of $1,000. And then there's also a public prize. If you choose to put your story into our uh, public forum and let other people vote on it, uh, there's going to be a $500 fi uh, uh, prize for that. Um, so if you sign up for our newsletter, you'll be first to get information and um, uh, be able to participate there. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, we actually hadn't um, thought about setting something up for your folks for beta, but uh, as of tomorrow, <laughs> if you yeah. come into our website and go to storybuilder.com forward slash red sneaker, yes. um, I'll have a uh, backdoor set up for you so that uh, you can sign up and we'll give you six months for free. Oh, fantastic. Mm-hmm. Everybody hear that? I'll put that in the show notes too. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. This is not your mm-hmm. first entrepreneurial venture, mm-hmm. is it, Tanya? It I think uh, somewhere yeah. I read you were referring to yourself as a serial entrepreneur. Yeah. <laughs> What's that about? Uh, I don't, I've been, I've just been in business since I was 10. Um, <laughs> I've had, 10. well, I started babysitting when I was 10. I, uh, uh, I was doing data entry for the public library when I was 13. 12, 13, 13. Um, yeah, I've just always been doing stuff. Uh, my, my last major business was uh, the CD and video store in Stratford, Ontario, uh, from which I did spin out a Shakespeare specialty catalog, uh, which um, uh, ended up with customers in 42 countries around the world. We had uh, James Earl Jones was a customer and Kenneth Branagh. It was, it was a good time. <laughs> so. And you're still doing other things, right? This is like mm-hmm. your side mm-hmm. gig or something. <laughs> yeah, it still is. Well, I still have to keep the lights on and then a roof over my right. head. So um, I'm a content uh, freelance uh, strategist in, in my day. I do everything from uh, web development to information architecture to content creation and digital marketing. Um, so I've been able to bring all of those things together and put them into my website. So, Well, I think it sounds mm-hmm. fascinating. And I think a lot of people are going to be interested in giving it a spin. So tell us again, mm-hmm. what's the website with the special promo code? Yeah, It'll be Story Builder. Builder is B-I-L-D-E-R, no U. So storybuilder.com forward slash red sneaker. And we'll Fantastic. get you set up. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody, and people listening to this on the podcast, I'll put that in the show notes. Tanya, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you, Bill. This is great. I really appreciate your time. Thanks. You bet. <laughs> All right, sneakers. I'll just remind you again that if you're writing, aspiring to write, thinking about writing, written many books, hey, join our Facebook group, which is also called Red Sneaker Writers. So you can get or contribute daily updates. We have a nice conversation going on there, and I'd like you to be a part of it. And I mentioned this at the top of the show, too, but I also have an e-newsletter that goes out usually every other week. I took one off for the holidays, but usually every other week, this free, doesn't cost you a thing, e-newsletter, the Red Sneaker Writer newsletter with new tips and usually a feature article on some aspect of writing and how to do it successfully. If you'll just send me your email address, I will add you to the list free of charge. And you you can see if you like that. My email address is wilburn at gmail.com. First four letters are both names. So that's W-I-L-L-B-E-R-N at gmail.com. Send me your email address and I'll add you to the mailing list. Remember that you can follow this podcast so it is automatically downloaded for you each time we load a new episode. Uh, You can do that at any place you get podcasts. If you prefer the video version, please go to my site on web uh, on YouTube. That's the William Bernhardt channel and subscribe to it. You'll be alerted every time we live stream every time we upload a new episode right after it's completed. All right. Well, I hope you're enjoying 2022. It's just going to get better from here on out. I promise. So until next time, keep writing. And remember, you cannot fail if you refuse to quit. See you next time.